Good evening and welcome to the overnight edition of From Day One. As you can hear, Art Bell is ready and ready to go. In the background tonight, from September 30th, 2015, we have guest Albert Taylor talking about out, oh, sorry, out of body experiences. We bring you Midnight in the Desert. So, from the 25 time zones in the Great American Southwest, here he is the man, the myth, the legend. Art Bell. From the high desert in the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world's time zones, each and every one covered by this program, Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. It's good to be here, and uh, we're going to have a fun show tonight. Reflecting uh, very quickly on last night's program, yes, I know, it was hard, harsh, scary, unfortunately realistic. Uh, and that's what we do every now and then. I, I think people have forgotten um, how I do programs over the years. They have selective memories, and uh, I will bounce back and forth between everything. Uh, the scary... And then there's the other kind of scary. <laughs> we have ghosts, right? That's good scary. Nuclear weapons, bad scary. I understand, trust me. But I have always done that. I have always bounced back and forth. And people, I don't know, I think they uh, tend to forget that over the years. I mix it up a lot. Like tonight, for example. <laughs> mix it up. Uh, no bad language. I have two rules. That's one. And the other is only one call per show. I've got people to thank. Telos, Joe Talbot, thank you. Uh, Keith Rowland, my webmaster. Heather Wade, my producer. And I want to remind you, if you've got a good idea for a guest, and I mean a really good idea, get with Heather. And the way you do that is producer at artbell.com. Could not be easier. Producer at artbell.com. She loves ideas. Stream guys, LV.net, sales, Pete Eberhardt. Uh, tune in radio, of course, Leo Ashcraft, Dark Matter News, and a lot more, really. He does a whale of a job. So, um, all those people, thank you. Let's read just a little bit of news. We're going to talk about OBEs tonight. You know, there's no question about it. I know you guys love that topic, as do I. Uh, we did it all that, not that long ago with President Bennett, but uh, the real guy for OBEs, the original guy, is Dr. Albert Taylor. He's going to be with us this night. Well, Russia launched airstrikes Wednesday in Syria. They were supposed to hit ISIS, but instead they, take this in quotes, mistakenly hit uh, enemies of the uh, of the regime there did a lot of damage too. So we kind of had a meeting uh, with them in the middle of the day and said, "Come on, let's uh, coordinate military activity here and do what needs to be done." And they sort of said, "Duh." <laughs> so we'll see. It's not good though. The Taliban is gaining new ground. I don't have any good news, do I? Uh, Taliban is gaining new ground in Afghanistan. They uh, have taken another key town. It's just not good news at all. So there are recommendations that American boots on the ground be extended for more time. This is from TheAnomalist.com. The world is full of anomalies and curiosities that defy explanation. But ultimately... One of the biggest mysteries resides within our own human brains. It's mostly an unexplored frontier that science only has begun to under understand, and this recent research on what's called blind sight is a perfect example of one of those inexplicable mysteries. How are people able to still perceive the world around them when they've got either partial or total blindness, but the fact is, they can. Now, as if you needed any more convincing about aliens, it seems there is a top-secret FBI memo 
released by the Haiku Center for UFO Research in Tokyo, Japan, and they claim they've discovered a document that proves there is extraterrestrial life. The FBI memo contains details about applying, actually flying saucers, multiple, being piloted by three feet tall aliens, three foot tall. Bureau is said to be concerned about the findings at the research center. I imagine they are. Fearing the discovery could lead to members of the public gaining access to thousands of documents. God knows where it might go. The FBI memo reportedly reads, an investigator for the Air Force states that three so-called flying saucers have been discovered in New Mexico, uh, described as being circular in shape, raised centers about 50 feet tall, or 50 feet rather in diameter, I'm sorry, each one occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. According to Mr. Redacted, of course, right, the saucers were found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has highly powered radar set up in the area, and it's believed the radar interferes with the controlling mechanism of the saucers. Isn't that interesting? They actually came to a conclusion, apparently, according to this, about what brought the saucers down, radar radiation. Well, I have two comments on that. Number one, the fact that this is included would indicate to me that after Marcel found what he found, it wasn't just all dismissed at all, as a balloon or what have you, but they actually did enough of an investigation, if this is true, to have uh, come to a conclusion, false though it may have been, that our radar brought them down. That sort of adds an extra ounce of credibility to the whole story, in my opinion. Well, all right, coming up, Dr. Albert Taylor. He is a number one uh, Los Angeles Times best-selling author and former, this is going to get you, aeronautical engineer and scientist on the International Space Station. That's right. Dr. Taylor spent two and a half decades evaluating systems designs on a wide variety of top-secret government programs like the F-117A stealth fighter, the Strategic Defense Initiative Anti-Ballistic Missile Program, and uh, otherwise known as Star Wars. He was born and raised in Southern California. So he's a California boy, currently a paranormal researcher, international lecturer and speaker, working on the latest book, which he calls Journey of the Cosmic Soul, a detailed scientific and spiritual study resulting from over 20 years of -of out-of-body paranormal and astrophysical research. Beyond that, he is a robotics expert designing and building fully semi-autonomous robotic probes to support his ongoing research of various types of paranormal um, phenomena. So, there you have it. Um, it, That's an amazing, amazing background for somebody who is going to talk about what he's going to talk about. I think it's absolutely incredible. And the way some electronics operates is incredible, too. Anyway, Dr. Albert Taylor, about to talk with you about OBEs. Want to take a ride? Your conductor, Art Bell, will punch your ticket when you call 1-952-CALL-ART. That's 1-952-225-5278. That's the number, all right, but hold your calls, because here comes Dr. Albert Taylor. Doctor, welcome to Midnight in the Desert. I thank you for the wonderful introduction, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, It has been how long? Uh, um, almost 19 years, I think, oh. that we've been talking since uh, 1996. I would say that would be about right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so 
I, I found out recently, uh, having done a show with Preston Bennett, uh, mm -hmm. that this audience, this particular audience, is really wild, as am I, I might add, about OBEs. It's the one, mm -hmm. it's the one thing that you can do within yourself that doesn't require expensive airline tickets. Uh, it doesn't require special passes or anything else. You can just do it. You can go out of your own body and I guess you can go anywhere in the world and beyond. Well, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it, too, so you can include me in that. But how you got to that stuff um, before, I mean, after the International Space Station and Star Wars and the F-117 and all that cool stuff, uh, do you still possess classified stuff? Uh, no, I don't. No, that would be uh, probably against the law, so... No, I do have some, um... No, I, I, I meant, I meant classified knowledge. Oh, oh, yeah, there's some things that I can't talk about. Okay, let's that, talk about those. When that's going to expire. Sure. Uh, I know it's expired. Let's talk about that. <laughs> no. Why not? Let's talk about it. <laughs> i share what I can. Anybody... So, you know, yeah, America is awesome. Our technology is unbelievable. Uh, it's projected... Out some of the things we work on today are 40 to 50 years in the future for any other nation developing similar tech. So we have a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, we do, and we've got a lot of scary stuff, too. Yes, we do. I did a show on that last night. Um, I don't know if you happen to hear that. If you did, I'm surprised you're feeling well today. <laughs> <laughs> it's really scary. Um, all right, so... I sort of read your background uh, in the government, but if you want to go into uh, detail about what you did, uh, just short of classified, you're welcome to do so. I, I mean, the International Space Station, that's interesting anyway. What did you do? Um, basically, I was responsible for the pressurized mating adapter that the shuttle used to dock to, and uh, the crew would transfer from the shuttle to a uh, one of the nodes, which is a command and control node. I was also responsible for the design and components in the command and control node. I was also responsible for the cupola, which is like one of the coolest things on the space station, which is the, the windows um, in that um, like octagonal pattern that you can then right. astronauts look out and they look at the Earth. Yes. Um, and also I was responsible for the airlock, which the astro astronauts don their EV, their spacesuits, and they Exit to foreign maintenance and uh, research on the space station. That is such an exciting stuff. My God. Extremely um, exciting. Extremely. Um, so I, I want to ask you this. Uh, how disappointed are you that the U.S. space program seems, what's the right word, um, stagnant, moving backward, not progressing, I mean, we should be on our way. We should have been Mars, in my opinion, already. Well, if you remember when 2001, A Space Odyssey came out. Of course. Um, we were thinking in 2001 we would have all those things. Uh, we didn't even come close. We're not even close to that now. Um, we've made some mistakes. Uh, we've invested in... Uh, on, you know, every, I love the shuttle, but we only we should not have invested in just the shuttle. We should have had more than one heavy lift vehicle during that process that we were developing at the same time. That way, we wouldn't be developing it now. The SLS is a heavy lift vehicle, but we would have had it a long time ago. It probably would have made it easier to build this, the, um, so the space station also in its original configuration, which would have been able to build um, uh, interplanetary vehicles in space in a big mm -hmm. shed that we designed. So I'm tremendously disappointed. I think we're going to pick up speed and get going once Orion uh, starts flying and all the other vehicles that uh, so some of the civilian stuff is doing and, and with people like Buzz Aldrin, which he's, you know, really pushing the Mars thing, which I think is so awesome. Um, and all the, and, and the latest discovery of, uh, water. of water, that is a huge incentive for us to go there. So I think we're going to make up for lost time, but... Yeah, it has been a huge disappointment. Actually, I am even more disappointed than that. I, I thought that by now, 
uh, we would be working on warp type drawings. Uh, draw, and we and there are some out there trying to work on them. But I mean, to use the kind of rockets we've been using uh, to get into low Earth orbit or to geosync or even to the moon is never really going to get us uh, very far. Maybe it'll get us to Mars and back if if, if those who go are lucky. <laughs> Uh, if you remember, you remember when we were, uh, when Neil Armstrong and, and, and Apollo 12 and 14 and were landing on the moon. Yes. Do you remember that during, um, I think it was 14, hardly anybody was watching it on, and even the major news carriers weren't carrying the actual walk. I know. So Everybody got bored. All of this is, yeah, what drives all of this is enthusiasm. And sometimes our enthusiasm wanes when it becomes, you know, repetitive, like the shuttle launches. Mm -hmm. After a while, people weren't watching them until something happened, and then everybody was watching those first two launches, and then we went back to forgetting about it. I know. So that's why, if we could maintain that enthusiasm, I think we could progress a lot faster than we have been. Well, if we could be on our way to Alpha Centauri uh, much faster than the speed of light, I would get really, really excited. Uh, that's kind of where I had sort of hoped uh, we'd be, but we're not. Uh, and I, there are people on the plus side, there are people, Dr. Taylor, uh, beginning to work on uh, warp drives, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, I've seen some, um, some um, articles and, and uh, videos on on things that they're working on, and even different concepts on types of engines. And I think we're, we're going to be able to do all of that, you know. And, and it's just going to take a, a time, and we're going to have to be patient. And um, I, you know what's really exciting, though, Art, is that civilian uh, industries are getting involved, and that's what drove the aircraft designs that we have today. Mm -hmm. So once civilians get involved and start making it a you know a profitable situation, because that's how we, our economy works, that's really what's going to drive the technology and the deeper exploration and um, the really exciting part of space travel. In the meantime, uh, we've probably got a better chance of doing an OBE and going to Mars than we do uh, with NASA, at least for yeah, the time being. it doesn't cost anything. It's well, free. <laughs> that's right. No tickets involved. And, you know, when I first heard, when you first told me about OBEs all those years ago, I went, oh, yeah, right. Right. This is and really, yeah. it's foo-foo stuff. You know, I, I tend to stay away from real foo-foo stuff. Right, right. But the truth okay. is, it works. Now, I'm not claiming that I have personally done it extensively. I, I, I've done it very quickly. I'm telling you the same story I did all those years ago, and I popped right back in, but I was out long enough to say, oh, my God, I was out. So it does work. But And then along come people like you, President Bennett, who tell me, not only can you go out of your body, but you can go anywhere you want. Tristan says you can walk right through walls. Do you yeah. agree with that? Oh, definitely. You can go anywhere you can focus your consciousness on. And that's, that's a task in itself because you have to stay focused. There's so much going on, and not everybody's going to be at that super conscious level to be able to do that. Some people are going to be in various lower levels, like dream states, semi-conscious states, semi-lucid states. So if you can focus your consciousness, and, and you can go there. Most people think that you, you can focus on the same things that you would experience that you want to do in everyday life like uh, you want to go to the Bahamas or something like that. But that's not how it works because when you get into that other state, which almost is like a hypnotic, super conscious state, you're only going to be able to focus on what's passionate to you. Can we go back to walls for just a moment? Uh, okay. Preston, Preston said something that I would like you to deal with, um, and I thought it was just kind of cool. He said that depending on what you're walking through, you can feel a little something as you go through. Uh, the, the more dense an object, uh, it's not hard to walk through any wall, but the more dense an object, uh, you feel a little something as you go through that density. Is that true? Oh, that, you know, it's, uh, I've, I've been doing this for a while now, and, you know, I've heard a lot of people 
share uh, their experiences. And I can always tell when someone really knows what it feels like by details that you don't hear about. And that's one of them. I, I, talk, I have talked about it periodically, but I don't talk about it that much. You never talk really? about that with me. <laughs> it's well, like it's like twenty it, years ago, man. It is like the cops that hold back important information so they they know when they really got their guy. That you know the thing about the second body, or as Robert Monroe called it, or the astro body, is that it's super sensitive. I mean, far more sensitive than what your the information you'd get from your five senses or touching something. Mm -hmm. So when you feel a fiber or even pass through a surface you feel every, almost every molecule that's yeah. in that surface. And it's so incredibly, you can almost get, that's why I was saying, if you can focus on a, a place, you can go there, but it's so hard to focus on a, a distant place or a location because of the experience in the present that you're going through. Just feeling that sen sensation, you can get lost doing that. One, I remember in the beginning, I would just lay there moving my legs, my astral legs up and then back down through the bed and touching the carpet mm -hmm. and then moving up. And I would just keep doing that. I wasn't even thinking of flying or going anywhere, but that's how amazing uh, the whole experience is. All right. Well, understand. Some in my audience right now are going, oh, come on. Others uh, who have done this are going, I completely understand. And I have now spoken to so many people with so many details that I know that what you guys are saying is true. I want to be able to do it myself. And uh, just as all those years ago, uh, Dr. Taylor, I can get to the edge. I can get mm -hmm. to the buzz. I can get to even the partial paralysis, but then I freak out and cop out and right. come back, and I just can't release control. And that's something that only you can overcome, unfortunately. I wish I could. I can get you to the doorstep and tell you all the techniques. And, yeah, I know. And, 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 but the thing about it, stepping through is and that's a hard thing. It's, I'm, I'm not going to say it's easy at all because there's a fear of the unknown. We've been nature has inbred that. I mean, instilled that upon us to survive. So fear of the unknown is a huge factor. Well, of um, course it is. Stories is a huge factor. Um, and all the scary things we hear about that. Um, religious beliefs is a huge factor. So all those things are. And, and I said, like I said earlier. Our, our, our senses are heightened. So if you're going to go through a fearful emotion, it's going to almost feel like tenfold. Okay. And it's going to be so intense, you're going to think it's real. All right, so well, here, here's a question for you. Here's a question for you. Um, you're able to walk through solid objects. Mm -hmm. You're also, I take it, able to walk through a person. I haven't tried that one yet. Really? But I would think you could, any, any material surface. Okay. Living or dead. Uh, that's right. That's right. We're just a bunch of water sacks, right? Mm -hmm. So presumably in that state, you could walk through a person. And mm -hmm. if you did, uh, as with other solid things, if you feel a little something when you move through it, I wonder if a living being would feel moved through. It would, you know, I haven't done that. Um, and I'm going to put on my bucket list, though, for sure, because I'll see what happens. Um, but I would think because of the heightened sensations that you have, it might be a mind-melting kind of situation. I think definitely you're going to pick up on some type of life force like energy. You're going to, you're going to definitely be in touch with the astral energy. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, there will be something, and because I've heard of people having near-death experiences at the same time yes. in, in car accidents, and they were able to uh, feel each other's emotions and, 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 and even communicate, I think doing that, you probably would be able to sense a lot of things. It just may not be two-way. Well, I'm glad that you brought up NVEs because I have talked to any number of people who have been um, actually either on top of or hugging a relative who died, uh, Dr. Taylor, Mm -hmm. And they said they felt that person's soul pass through them. 
Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. We we are, you know, um, I think, like I said a long time ago, and a friend of mine used to say, we are the ghosts that we think we see and, and things like that. We are them. So if we're the same thing, and in, in, in out-of-body experiences that I've had, you share a lot of um, emotion and not just thought energy, but you share a lot of emotion. For So for someone to transition from a living body and pass through a living person, I would imagine that that's going to be a very spiritual experience, probably not only losing a loved one, but the actual sensation is going to be life-changing. Well, if you lost a loved one and felt that, you would interpret it instantly. But if you were just in everyday life and somebody passed through you in an OBE state, you might just sort of go, oh, that was a weird feeling or something akin to that. In other words, uh, there'd be no bump. There would be, though, a sensation of... I don't know, a sensation. I'll try to find words for it. Uh, Dr. Taylor, hold on. We've got news, a couple spots, and then lots of open territory for discussion of OBEs. From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. Exclusively on the Dark Matter Digital Network, Midnight in the Desert, with Art Bell. Now, here's Art. Here I am. Uh, Dr. Albert Taylor is here, and I just want to emphasize one more time. You know, if you know somebody uh, who is really in pain, or if you're really in pain, I've had this bad back uh, all my adult life. The only thing that has ever helped, seriously helped me, has been this Lumen business, and it, I'm telling you, it works. From me. Uh, and as you, it, you know what? If somebody out there gets one of these things, and I'm sure you will, for me it's back pain. It works on all kinds of things. But if somebody out there gets one of these things and wants to publicly discuss it here on the air, I'd be up for that. A miracle for me. Um, now, just before, I, I want to try and put words to it. Um, we were talking about a person in an OBE state walking through a solid body of another person. And I, I think I felt that happen. I could swear I have. It's like, I, tried to, I said I had to put words to it. It's kind of like somebody is suddenly in the room or somebody is suddenly watching you. Uh, we, we have talked um, other times about, you know, for animals, for example, they know uh, just before a hunter is going to uh, let go of a, an arrow toward them, they know just before... They're going to squeeze the trigger. They start, and then, of course, startle, and then it's it's too late. Uh, they're probably dead, but it, is that kind of feeling like uh, something's there, something's with me, just a little shiver? That's what I'm talking about, Albert. It, it could, you know, because of um, there's some paranormal things going on there, um, ions involving ions, so you could feel a sense of a chill, um, a, a, fin, uh, a sense yeah. of being cold. Right. Um, you could feel uh, 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 a sense of being warm, warm also, um, emotional, extremely emotional, um, like happy, sad kind of emotion, mm -hmm. not just sad because of the person uh, departing. So, and, and you, you know, you got to think about this. We have are basically in energy with a lot of different uh, organic and uh, material. The person dying is energy with a lot of organic material, but when the body dies, that energy stays, it, it doesn't die. You can only transform energy. So if that energy passes through your energy field, it makes sense that there is going to be some type of interaction yes. and some type of flux in your energy field. And because we sense energy emotionally, it's going to tap into that emotion that, you know, is affected by that kind of emotional or supercharged energy. All right. A I lot like of that. people in, in, my, in our, our audience tonight, uh, Dr. Taylor, um, don't believe this. They don't believe that you can actually travel out of your body. Another segment of our audience knows you can oh, yes, because right. they have done so. 
Yeah, so totally um, if you were asked for proof that it's possible to leave your body, is it supplyable? Um, and this is, this is what's awesome about it is because I totally understand the skepticism. I was skeptical. I didn't think this was even close to possible. I grew up Catholic, and you didn't talk about that stuff. Even though I was having strange things happen to me, there's no way I thought that I was having an out-of-body experience. But I think personally, you can talk to me and share with me all until the cows come home about this. But if I don't have a personal experience, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. So what's so really awesome about um, out-of-body experiences is that there's a certain mechanics to it, even though there's a certain spiritual and meditative state to it. But there's a certain mechanics to it that if you do these certain things, it increases your chances of having one. And I, I suggest to anybody, it be skeptical, but be open. Okay, we'll, we'll get to this. But what I asked was, if I asked you to prove OBEs are real, would you have any way to do that? I... I think the personal experience proves it more than anything. I can't say, you mean like, um, I'll go to this room, like a remote viewing kind of situation, where I'll go to this room and see what's there and come back and report it to you? That yeah, kind of, something like that. That um, I think some people probably, maybe, um, can do that. Um, I haven't been able to do that because it's very difficult for me to focus on on. Very, very basic things like visiting um, Disneyland and because there's so much, it's, the more I've done it over the years, the more it's become a spiritual, incredible, supercharged, I mean, you have experiences with the light and death, de deceased loved ones and all the physical things that I thought I wanted to do pale in comparison. So I, I think that's difficult to do that. And I, I welcome if anybody out there, because there's a lot of astral travelers out there who have skills maybe beyond mine ever could be. Um, so it, I would say it's definitely possible. It doesn't seem to fit into my experiences. Okay, well, if something like this, for example, um, let's say that you journey out of body and you go to Uncle Phil's in uh, Northern California and you observe mm -hmm. something in Uncle Phil's room that's different or surprising or shocking. And you get back in your body, and you pick up the phone and call Uncle Phil and verify whether or not what you just saw is the truth. Well, I can share this experience that um, I have had. And I've had two interesting ones okay. that led me to think that it's more than just a dream or something like that. All right. I had a friend of mine at work who, um, who I felt comfortable talking about this. And um, she said to come visit her. And I thought, okay. So um, through the process of relaxing and f flying, because that's what you do in the out-of-body experience, mm -hmm. and arriving at this location, um, I only thing I could do was start, uh, you know, looking around and trying to remember, because it's very difficult to remember things, remember what I was saying. So I saw a chandelier that was larger than it should have been at her in her particular dining room, I saw a hallway with three doors. Hmm. I saw a window with um, an odd window in the corner of the room with a telephone pole blocking half of it. And out that, I saw a um, an alleyway. So when I came back to my physical body, I wrote all of this down. And we were working at the space station at the time. And I went upstairs. I know, talking about the space station. What you really don't want to do, actually, is walk <laughs> into your boss's room, uh, you know, at NASA and say, guess what I just did? Yeah, I know. That was something that was really, we whispered. We, it was almost. You would be shuttled out of there so quickly? Yeah. No, that wouldn't have been very good for getting a raise or, or anything like that. Um, but anyway, I shared it with her, and what I saw matched her apartment. So I was, you know, I mean, that didn't matter to me. I was still extremely skeptical. But this was what really was interesting, is I had an experience with this woman who had a near-death experience. And she also, she was the first person that ever told me, you know, you're probably having out of body experiences. And I was really skeptical when she said that. But she said, come visit me. And so that night, because I was developing some techniques on how to get out of it, I was getting about, you know, 50% to 60% um, um, success in what I was doing, 
is I traveled to her house. I found myself traveling. And that's what's interesting is you think you're flying alone, but you're really not. You have company. And so I thought I was flying alone, but I, I wasn't. And I arrived at this location I'd never been. I came, and I thought I was going to crash into the roof. I, I went through the ceiling. Mm-hmm. I could see the insulation. I could see plumbing, electrical wire. And then I found myself at the foot of the bed of somebody in the bed. And I'm looking at them, and I, I see it's the person that I wanted to see, the, the, the doctor who had a near-death experience. And I looked around the room, and the first thing I noticed was that she, I thought she had a cast on her leg, and her leg was broken. Yes. And I thought, okay, I don't remember her leg being broken in a class, so that's something interesting to remember. And another thing I remember is seeing, um, they, it was two, twin beds, and her husband or somebody was, I knew she was married, sleeping on the other side of the uh, room in another bed. I guess they'd been married for a long time, but that <laughs> might be besides the point. Right. I thought, okay, that's good to remember too. So when I returned back and wrote all this down, I couldn't wait to go see her. She was teaching a uh, college course at the local college out here. And I went up to her and I said, something really incredible happened. I had an incredible dream. And she said to me, you know, on Saturday, because this is the same day it happened, I had the experience, on Saturday, I had a dream that you were standing at the foot of my bed. Mm-hmm. And I thought, hmm, okay. And I looked at her leg. Her leg looked fine. It didn't look broken. I thought, well, in the dream sequence I had, you had a broken leg. And uh, you had something, a white cast on your leg. And she said, no. She said, but I do sleep with a heating pad on my leg because I have arthritis in my knee. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. And then I said, you know, I know you're married, but in my dream situation, I, I said, you on your husband was sleeping way on the other side of the room. And she said, yeah, we, um, he sleeps way on the other side of the room because he has sleep apnea and he wakes me up at night. Oh. So I went home. I mean, I was, I, I went home shocked at this. And I was thinking, could this, because I was thinking, could this be real? Could we really be had? Is it possible for a part of us to actually leave the physical body? And and does that mean that we have a, a soul or a spirit of some sort? And I literally, I could not go to sleep all night long thinking about it. So are you telling me this was at the very beginning of your astral travel? Yes. This was wow. Like, I didn't even know what it was exactly, except okay. for the doctor sharing with me, you probably are having out of body experiences. That was the first I'd, I'd read in when I was a kid about near death experiences. Wait, 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 uh, wait, about, wait, wait. Uh, doctor shared with you that you're, in other words, you went yeah. to a physician. Oh, uh, no, no. Let me, let me back up. Okay. She was teaching a class at the college. And because she had had a near death experience, she was teaching a class on that. Ah, okay, okay. So I went to the class because I was looking for answers on what was happening to me because. It went from happening sure. once every couple of weeks to happening several times a week, three times a week, and then sometimes three times a night. So it got my wow. attention. Oh, you better, so, better get my attention too. Yeah. 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 And I, and I would, you know, and this was happening at night and then I'd have to go and literally fly to Houston Space Center and help train the astronauts on how to assemble the space station in the giant pool there. Right. So it, it was, and it was, let's say it's distracting and stressful. So I went to her, uh, to the class, and during the class, she was the first person outside of my family that ever said, has anybody ever, ever felt paralyzed that night? And my hand shot up because I'd never heard anybody talk about that except for my family. And I said, yeah, it happens to me all the time. And she immediately replied, and she was the first person ever said, she said, you may be having out-of-body experiences. Were you uh, worried for your mental stability? Oh, definitely, definitely. As a matter of fact, that's the first thing I did is I went to see a, a psychiatrist to be evaluated. Uh, really? Uh, I'm curious. Yeah. What did the uh, psychiatrist say? Well, I, I went because I was, like I said, I didn't know about this stuff. So I was thinking uh, because it was happening to several people in my family that it was neurological and, and, or, or, or maybe a psychosis of some sort. So I went to the doctor and I explained to him some of the things, not in detail. <laughs> I wanted to leave and go home, too. But <laughs> I, I explained to him some of the details of the things that were happening. And they put me through 
an incredible amount of testing, MRIs, uh, neuro neurological, uh, ink blood, all really, kinds of Really, really. And he gave me a flying color. I mean, a great evaluation. So, but that was, I was disappointed. Did he give you a, uh, did he give you a conclusion, doctor? He said that it doesn't seem to have any problem. I'm, I'm rational, I'm logical. I, my job doesn't seem to be affected by anything that would be uh, indication, uh, interaction with people, on and on, all these criteria that I didn't know that whole, whole lot about, but basically he said, you're fine. But I was disappointed, Art, because I wanted him to find something. I get it. I wanted him to find a physical thing so I could say, oh, that's it. What do I do about it? Take a pill, therapy, whatever. But when he said I was okay, I knew that, okay, that means I'm on my own. I've got to go back to the situation that's happening several times a night and deal with it. Right. And because I'm a researcher, I thought, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to document my descent into insanity. And that's how my I, I, Yeah, it honestly sounds like a, a real... A train of thought that I can understand for somebody who's in hard sciences and is trying to figure out what the hell's going on in their own mind. Right. It's a and logical. I, figured, yeah. I was going to go crazy. I was losing it. Alzheimer's and uh, uh, whatever the 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 uh, problem. And I was when they. I figured when they found me babbling and drooling in the corner. <laughs> Yeah. They, my book, my manuscript, my book would be laying there, and they could figure out how I got there. That's what I was doing. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you you qualify uh, easily as an expert on OBEs. Let's do this. Let's do an how to have or how to increase the possibility of your having an OBE. What would your list of suggestions be, please? Okay, and first of all, it happens to almost everybody every night. We just don't remember. So the, mm -hmm. one of the, the techniques is to remember it's happening. Okay, that's one of the things. Um, we sleep, uh, depending on how tired you are, we sleep very, very heavy in the beginning, and then we come up to a lighter REM state toward the morning, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, right before we wake up. Well, I already want to stop you on number one. You said okay. uh, the first most important thing is to remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how do we differentiate? How are we to know the difference between a very, very graphic dream, and some of them are, and an OBE? Well, because dreams you forget about. Sometimes you don't even remember when you wake up. And even when you do remember them, they don't usually have any profound emotional impact on you. An out-of-body experience will have a profound impact on you. You will not think of it like a dream. It will laugh. You'll be thinking about it. You'll have questions. Um, you may experience the intense fear that I was talking about, because you don't usually experience that in a, in a dream, not this intense. So they will be so different that you will not forget about it okay. at all. All right, that's number one. Then number two is, I'm sorry, number two. Okay. Um, so, so basically, um, what one of, so one of the things that I discovered is that toward the early morning part, we remember our dreams more. We have lucid dreams. That's when I was having a lot of lucid dreams. That's when I would fly in my dreams and things like that. So what I did is I experimented on how to on recreating it. In what, it in, naturally. in what way? Uh, but what I did is I would go to bed about ten o'clock at night. I'd set my alarm for about maybe o'clock in the morning, yes. I'd get out of the bed and not just reach over and turn it off, because I noticed when I couldn't sleep sometimes and, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and go back to bed, that's when I would have the experience. So yeah. I'd get out of the bed, stay up for about an hour, drink water, don't eat anything, just drink water, right. and then go back to bed and then lay it perfectly still, and this is really important, lay perfectly, perfectly still and relax every part of the portion of your body from head to toe. Okay. And what's going to happen here is if, have you ever been really, really tired and you were driving a car and for that brief second you you nodded out, just a brief second, and oh, yeah. it's Yes, yes, and um, when you come back to consciousness, it is sheer terror. Yeah, definitely. So what, what you've done in this, I call it this, I call this the interrupt the sleep technique. What you've done is recreated that situation except now you're in a safe environment. 
So no matter how hard you try to stay awake, if you're laying perfectly still, you're going to reach that point where the body is going to nod off. It's like it would in the car or something. If, if you hold still, it's going to happen. Even if you don't, you're going to fall asleep. But the thing is, is because you've interrupted the sleep pattern and given your body, your consciousness, about four hours to, to rest and sleep, when your body drops off, you're going to be at that heightened awareness state. And, and you may even, when it happens, and this really shocked me because when it happened, that was the first time I'd ever gone from consciously laying there to into a paralysis state where I couldn't move my physical body. Right. I actually heard myself snoring. And I thought it was someone else snoring because that was very close behind me, which almost scared me. Oh, I, I've heard that a lot. You actually hear your body snoring. Oh, I've heard that Sometimes that. people hear themselves snoring, and it wakes them up. So um, that's the state you want to get to. Yeah, I've been in that state any number of times. In the afternoon, I'll lay down on the couch. If it's boring, whatever I'm watching, uh, I'll lay on my back with my hands behind my head, and I'll start to fall asleep. And I don't know how many minutes later, I hear myself snoring. It's right. uh, embarrassing, actually. Right. Well, you've and come to a fork in the road right there. Really? And because you've altered it with interrupting your sleep pattern, it increases your chances of going into a lucid state rather than you're going into a deep sleep state. All right. Hold it right there. I love this subject. Go B.E.'s Dr. Albert Taylor is my guest. I'm Mark Bell, and this is Midnight in the Desert. Trust you, but remember the NSA. Well, you know, to call the show, please dial 1 952 225 5278. That's 1 952 call art. Love that one. Dr. Albert Taylor is my guest. We are discussing OBEs, and uh, I hope some of you have dragged out a piece of paper and are paying attention because he's telling us how to do it. First of all, most importantly, remember. Secondly, you might set the alarm. I know that this just doesn't sound intuitive, but for two in the morning, or three in the morning or something, uh, when you wake up, drink something perhaps, but don't eat, and then get into this relaxed state. Do I have it about right? That's it. And uh, no matter if you try to stay awake, you will. Something's going to happen. You're either going to drift back off into a deep state, which I doubt because of the interrupted time period, and or you're going to hear yourself snoring or find yourself paralyzed, or you're going to hear this loud rushing wind. I mean, extremely loud. Yes. Or you're going to hear, because it's a vibrational energy thing, you're going to hear a very loud buzzing sound. That would indicate the beginning of an OBE. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Definitely. That, it's like a road sign. Those are like road signs. The slower you go through the separation process, yes. the more you hear. So the slower you go, if you go through fast, some of those things you may not experience at all. But that slow process, those are things that you're going to hear as your invite, as you, your consciousness transitions from a physical state, which is your body, to a higher vibrational state, which is your astral form. Right. It vibrates at a little higher vibration, so you will hear and feel that vibration. All right, Doctor. All right, all right. Let's say that I'm up to step number four, and I've got the buzzing, and I feel uh, kind of paralyzed, and I want to take the next step. In other words, I want out of my body. This is where I fail. This is where I get scared, and I can't make it. What can I do at that juncture to jump, to go? Well, to, there's two things you need to do first is that you need to calm down because it's exciting. And the excitement can bring you back. You need to suspend any kind of ideas you have on what's going to happen. Just be an observer. Because if you if think about something, you could scare yourself during that process. Huh. Yeah, it could happen very easily. And then once that happens, if you have, if you can't see already, because sometimes the vision, your vision just comes on. If you can't see, 
say to yourself, I want to see. And this is really, I know it sounds simple, but ask and you shall receive. Okay. If you haven't moved anywhere, say, I want to float upward. And that's what usually gets things moving. The, the difference is, and I've talked to people who've awakened in the state and knew nothing about out of bike experiences, and one of the things that happens is they find themselves bouncing around the room, experiencing a total, being a totally out of control. Well, the, what's happening there is that you don't know you can control it. It's like jumping in a car and going down a hill and not grabbing the steering wheel. Every bump it hits, it's going to veer off and go in the direction. But know that you can control this by your desire and being able to focus on what you want to happen. Okay. Um, now, let's move on. Let's say that the impossible happens and I make it out. Uh, can I then choose a destination, and if so, how? Uh, you, well, if it's a person, which is easier than a location, a physical location, um, if you if they have an emotional impact on you while you're in the waking state, you should be able to think of them very easily, a loved one, your mother, um, a dear friend, something like that. If you can think of them, all you have to say is, I want to visit or I want to be with, and something strange might happen. Is like I said, touched on earlier, you're not alone. So you may not be able to see them, perceive them, because we're not talking about light coming through the optic nerve and bouncing off the retina or anything. We're, th we're talking about a sensation. You may feel someone touch you or grab you and push and assist you in the direction that you want to go in. Yeah, I don't know. I, I like that. I recommend, yeah, it's, that's the way it is. But it's a, it's, think of it more like a guardian angel. I mean, everybody accepts the fact that it's not going to harm you in any way, and that's basically what, what I'm talking about. You can call it anything you want, but it's the same thing. But I recommend for beginners, stay local. Do it, get, get better at it. Stay in the room. Move around the room. Okay. Touch things. Right. Touch things. Put your hands through things. Um, move into a different part of the house. Look for, uh, if you have children, go visit and look for the children. Um, right. What you'll find is something really interesting. Like I mentioned with the doctor who had the, uh, the, la the heat, uh, heat pad around her leg, is that you can interact with them in a way depending on how consciously they are aware. They may not be that aware or they may be, but you can. The more aware they are, the more you can interact with them. And it's really, really interesting. And like I said, that's why it's so hard to go beyond that because you have to focus is because there's so many incredible things you can do in just in your, the near vicinity of your, your body, your physical body. Just think how you could have messed with her, turned her heating pad up to 120. <laughs> you know, I, if I could move physical objects in that state, that would be yeah, very interesting. Uh, I don't, I don't think that it may not be impossible in the future for someone, but that would be an awesome um, talent or capability. It would be. Uh, anyway, I'm just messing with you. I know you can't uh, affect physical things. Uh, I can there, only wish. Right. There is never a case in that state where you can affect anything physical, right? No, no, I haven't been able to, and I don't uh, haven't heard or had any reports of anybody else being able to. But during the paranormal, um, of course, we have heard and seen video of non-physical consciousness uh, moving objects. So um, let's say it's not impossible, but it doesn't seem to apply for to an astral traveler or an out-of-body experiencer. Well, when I interviewed Preston Bennett, um, I asked him what I asked you years ago, and I will ask again now. And that is, can anything go wrong? Um, and is there anything dangerous about it? And his first reaction, like yours, was, oh, no, uh, nothing can ever go wrong. And if it does, you snap right back into your body like uh, a rubber band that's just been let go of. Uh, right? That's the answer. The worst thing that can happen is you scare yourself because you encounter something that's unknown. 
you know, this is the thing that I discovered, and I've been afraid of things like this since I was a little tiny kid, since I was five years old. And I said this, remember I shared this with you before, going into the um, astral plane and, and not wanting to see ghosts is like going into the ocean and not wanting to see fish. Mm -hmm. That's where they are. <laughs> so you projecting, or if you're scared of that, or you have a fear about that, the worst thing that could possibly happen is that you will scare yourself. But not everybody who is on the other side is angelic. That doesn't mean you're going to meet, you know, these wonderful souls over there. People carry a lot of their traits and who they are when they're over there at the lower state of the astral. Nasty on this side, nasty on that side. Yeah, you, so you could have a negative experience with something or someone, but... The thing is, is you always have been, I call it my ejection seat. You can always return to the physical, and they can't. Um, okay. And then there's one more step I'll take, and that is this. Can you be absolutely sure? I mean, we know that, uh, we've well, heard the old expression, dead men tell no tales, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they don't, as far as I know. Uh, how many people every year in the world die in their sleep? Answer, many, many, many. Mm -hmm. How can you be sure that uh, some of those people, of the many, 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 didn't die when something went wrong when they were out of the body? Okay, I don't think you can cause it to happen. I don't think you have that much power because there's a bigger story going on. There's a lot more that you that you are a part of and that you imp are important to, to, and part of that importance is your interaction in day-to-day -day life and how you affect people. So you can't interrupt that process just by doing something and remembering something that you normally do subconsciously anyway. So you don't have to worry about that. But the experience is the same. If you're, if you, a person is passing, can, uh, the probability of them having similar uh, disconnection experiences is going to be uh, high like yours. Let me give you an example. My cousin, uh, Robert, passed away years and years ago. And one of the things that happens in our family is we all have night paralysis issues. A lot of my family uh, are very, they're very superstitious. So they refer to it as witch rides or the witches are coming to ride you at night because you did something bad or they're trying to steal your soul. So that's uh, kind of a southern kind of superstition that my family has lived with for a long time. Robert, he also um, had out-of-body experiences, but didn't know that's what they were. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you again, um, because that's so interesting. You're saying this has been a genetic trait in your family. A long, for a long, as far back as I can remember. A great, great grandmother, uh, mm -hmm. it's been told cool. we've since I was a little kid, and, and it's, but I've always thought that's what it was, and it's always been something terrible and horrifying, and none of us liked it. And I was the first one to change and just try to be an observer and discover a whole new aspect. To it. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, the, the, I find the genetic link very interesting. Um, I, you know, I've been all over the place, and I wondered that too. That's because I'm a researcher. I was wondering, okay, is it in my family? Uh, like I said in the beginning, I thought it was a psychosis or a neuro neurological problem. Um, but what I found, having been lucky enough to, to go all over the world talking to people about this, is it, it, it doesn't matter what you are, it doesn't matter what you believe. People of all walks of life have these kind of experiences. And what's really cool is I do this experiment when I talk to people. So let's say I have 100 people in the room. One of the things is I start doing is I start mentioning the, the, the uh, different aspects of the separation process. I say, if you've ever experienced this in, uh, after going to bed at night, raise your hand and keep your hand up. And by the time I touch on the paralysis, the vibration, hearing your name being called, because that's one of them, right. and flying dreams and all these other things, says about 70% of the audience out of 100 are, are still have their hands up. So that's globally about 70% of people are having these, they can remember having these experiences. They just haven't pieced all the puzzles together mm -hmm. to figure out. Yes, this has to do. This is something that has to do with um, having an out of out of body experience. And with that, that's where we will leave it for this evening. 
Come on back for the next portion of Out of Body Experiences tomorrow night with Albert Taylor and the great immortal Art Bell. Until then, make sure you do like, share, and subscribe. Be kind to one another and release the Kraken. As we march along here every day from day one. Again, we're thinking about doing a mobile version. If you like it, let us know in the comments below. Until then, have a great night.